uh, and it was a fairly easy paper as you all know uh, anesthesia usually is a very very easy subject and i tend to follow the trend and give you uh, questions accordingly so the first question that came was this continuation of which of the following medication strongly recommended before elective surgery so it is the question about pre operative drug therapy so you need to stop certain drugs before the surgery and you need to continue certain drugs before the surgery the question here asking is which is recommended to be stopped so we need to see the implication of that drug on the surgery and implication of the patient on the drug so let's start with clonidine metoprolol warfarin hydrochlorothiazide so this looks more like drugs that are given in a cardiac patient now what is clonidine it is an alpha agonist and in the past clonidine has been used as an anti hypertensive agent if you stop clonidine then the patient will have rebound hypertension that is the problem with alpha agonist therefore more or less in the management of hypertension we have stopped using alpha agonist as primarily uh, the uh, anti hypertensive agent second is metoprolol which is amazingly a beta blocker and we know beta blockers are the mainstay of management of hypertension angina uh, excessive heart rate stuff like that and beta blocker actually decreases the risk of mortality and morbidity during the surgery so it is supposed to be continued hydrochlorothiazide is a diuretic and we know that diuretics can be both okay and can have problems in fact you have to stop all diuretics except hydrochlorothiazide or thiazide diuretics thiazide diuretics you need to do this why because thiazide diuretics do not cause precipitous hypotension during the surgery while all other diuretics they cause resistant hypertension hypotension plus they also affect the electrolytes and therefore you need to stop them before surgery all right now we all know warfarin is an anticoagulant and an anticoagulant will always increase the risk of bleeding and therefore you need to stop it before surgery very obvious right warfarin will make the blood thinner that will cause increased risk of bleeding therefore you need to stop it before the surgery right now how much to stop so there are two criteria one is a target based criteria another is a day based criteria target based criteria is when you have the pt inr which measures the level of warfarin in the blood becomes less than 1.5 that is the time when you can go ahead with the surgery so if it takes one day to achieve a pt inr of 1. Point, less than 1.5 so you will stop warfarin for less than one uh, for one day if it takes 10 days you will stop for 10 days so this is more objective this is based on a test but there was an earlier day based criteria which was vague which was three to five days before surgery that means if the question is asked based on this previous criteria then they will not give you ptinr in the question they will give you just ask days so that would be three to five days before surgery it's a blanket criteria rarely used anymore rarely asked anymore but we need to know about it right so warfarin will increase the risk of bleeding and therefore it should not be continued before the surgery so this was the first question about pre-operative drug therapy second is asra that is american society of anesthesia uh, regional anesthesia guidelines for treatment of local anesthetic systemic toxicity that is last a very very important topic for your exam for cardiac arrhythmias includes intralipid and avoidance of all of the following drugs except so most of the questions that we have gotten in exam is based on last and use of intralipid we know the last is happening because of a toxic dose of local anesthetic which will cause cns toxicity and cvs toxicity cns is early toxicity it is milder it easily treatable while cns is cvs is a late form of toxicity which is grave and the reason you get cvs toxicity is because a highly lipid soluble local anesthetic which is bupivacaine which is also considered to be most cardiotoxic it binds to cardiac myocytes very adherently see at the end of the day it's a sodium channel blocker and the myocardium or the cardiac conduction heavily depends on electrical activity so it has got a lot of sodium channels in the nerves that it is supplying so local anesthetic will obviously go and bind but now the problem is that myocardial cells have high lipid component bupivacaine is very lipid soluble local anesthetic so that binding is very adherent so it doesn't dissociate from the receptor so early and therefore there is practically no treatment available for last except that you infuse intralipid now intralipid is a 20% lipid solution 
विच विल क्रिएट अ रिजर्व ऑयर इन द ब्लड दैट आर कंटेन्स लिपिड एंड द कार्डिक मायोसाइड कंटेन्स यूपी वेकिन सो दिस यूपी वेकिन विल स्टार्ट डिसोसिएटिंग फ्रॉम द रिसेप्टर एंड गोज इन टू द ब्लड दे आर बाई डिक्रीजिंग द इंटेंसिटी ऑफ द टॉक्सिसिटी सो इफ सपोज इट वुड हैव टेकन से फोर्टी एट आवर्स फॉर द पेशेंट टू रिकवर फ्रॉम दैट पर्टिकुलर एपिसोड ऑफ बुपेविकेन टॉक्सिसिटी विद इंट्रा लिपिड दैट विल गेट कट डाउन टू सिक्स आवर्स सो इट डिक्रीजेज द इंटेंसिटी ऑफ द टॉक्सिसिटी एंड देयर फोर द ड्रग ऑफ चॉइस फॉर ट्रीटमेंट ऑफ लास्ट दैट इज बुपेविकेन इंड्यूस्ड कार्डियो टॉक्सिसिटी दैट इज स्पेसिफिकली सीवियस टॉक्सिसिटी ऑफ बुपेविकेन वुड बी यूज ऑफ इंट्रा लिपिड नाउ अमेजिंग थिंग इज दैट अपार्ट फ्रॉम इंट्रा लिपिड देर इज प्रैक्टिकली नो अदर ड्रग दैट शुड बी यूज नथिंग earlier they used to give beritalium sotel all stuff like that but now they have stopped the use of any other drug except low dose epinephrine that is found to be beneficial because it is not only inotropic but it is also a vasopressor and in case cardiac arrest happens then amiodarone so no vasopressin no beta blocker no calcium channel blocker no sotel all nothing it is low dose epinephrine and eventually when cardiac arrest happens then adrenaline and amiodarone as per us ACLS protocol. So the correct answer here is low dose of epinephrine. Next is one of the favorite topics of the exam. That is CPR. You will always get one question of CPR from me in your GTS. That is because I want you all to be very very good at CPR because it is something which is sure shot. One question of CPR always comes in the exam. Now this is asking about the most common question asked. That is the chest compression for adults. That is do's and don'ts of high quality CPR rate between 60 to 80. at least 80 80 to 100 and 100 to 120 we know the rate of chest compression is 100 to 120 let's look at do's and don'ts of high quality cpr so you perform chest compressions at the rate of 100 to 120 so not less than 100 not more than 120 depth should be at least 2 inches that means not less than 2 not more than 2.4 allow full recoil between each compression that means you do not lean on the chest between compression because if you lean you will keep the uh, intrathoracic pressure positive because of the pressure and therefore there would not be any negative pressure which will suck the blood from periphery minimize pauses in the compression so you do not pause compressions you minimize the pauses that is do not interrupt it for more than 10 seconds and finally adequate ventilation that means 30 compressions followed by two breaths do not over ventilate over ventilation actually decreases the prognosis of a cardiac arrest victim so these are very very important do's and don'ts of high quality cpr from bls right next question is the maximum fio2 that can be delivered by a nasal cannula so this is a question which is based on oxygen therapy and this is a very very important topic because these days we get lot of questions from o2 therapy especially in the post covid era now and now we know that what is the significance of oxygen and how many ways can we give oxygen so now obviously the type of questions and the depth of questions from this topic will keep on increasing earlier we only used to get ki which is a low flow device which is a high flow device which is a, uh, a fixed uh, device which is a variable device but now we will start getting different different so i am also increasing the level so if you see there are multiple oxygen delivery devices the most basic one is nasal cannula that is simply a cannula that will give oxygen so your nasal dead space actually is filled with oxygen so that increases the fio2 you can use maximum 6 liters per minute with nasal cannula and the fio2 delivered will be 25 29 33 37 41 45 so maximum that can be delivered is 45 normally we are only supposed to remember minimum and maximum so at 1 liter 25% at 6 liters 45% even if you increase the flow rate of o2 more than 6% 6 liters it will not make a difference because the nasal dead space will remain the same so excess amount of oxygen will simply wash out for simple face mask that goes to at least 60% for non rebreathing mask at least 100% and for venturi mask you do not actually have a specific maximum value but it is actually with every color there is a fixed o2 device so uh, that color venturi valve will give that particular fio2 of oxygen so it is 24 28 31 35 40 60 so maximum is 60 so highest fio2 amongst simple o2 delivery devices can be given through a non rebreathing mask also called as nrbm non rebreathing mask that is approximately 100% practically we don't get more than 80 but theoretically we can say approximately 100% right <clears throat> last question the least reliable site for core temperature monitoring is least reliable site for core temperature monitoring is so we have got 
टेम्परेचर मॉनिटरिंग टेम्परेचर कैन बी कोर पेरीफेरल पेरीफेरल आर ऑल द प्लेसेज वेयर यू कैन मेजर एज एन इंटर्न सो दैट इज दैट विल बी स्किन ओरल रेक्टल एक्सिला एंड स्टफ लाइक दैट वाइल कोर वुड बी डीप बॉडी ऑर्गन सो दैट वुड ऑलवेज बी सम uh high in the some invasive technique or some technique that will not be very normally possible so there are different techniques like pulmonary artery temperature measures core body temperature distal one third of esophagus measures core body temperature nasopharynx measures core body temperature and tympanic membrane temperature will also measure core body temperature will also measure core body temperature but most reliably or gold standard for measurement of core body temperature is pulmonary artery gold standard for measurement of core body temperature is pulmonary artery right so which is the least reliable amongst this skin on the forehead because it is actually a peripheral temperature rest all are core body temperature skin of the forehead is a peripheral temperature so these were the five questions that i wanted you all to know and it will give you a overall revision of what is being asked in the exam as well so all the very best thank you